Section One. Listen to the conversation between Bob Wills, who is a foreign student advisor at a language school, and Angela Tung, who is a student, and complete the form. First, you have some time to look at questions one to eight on the form now. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. The conversation relating to this will be played first. Hello, Foreign Student Advisors Office. This is Bob Wills speaking. Can I help you? It's Angela Tung here, Bob. I'd like to make a request for special leave. Can I do that over the phone? Hello, Angela. You can make that request by phone, but I'll have to fill the form out. Let me get the special leave form. Okay, here it is. Hmm. Tell me your student number, please. It's H for Harry, five seven one two. H five seven one two. Okay. What's your address, Angela? Angela's student number is H five seven one two. So that has been written on the form. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Now listen carefully, and answer questions one to eight. Hello, Foreign Student Advisors Office. This is Bob Wills speaking. Can I help you? It's Angela Tung here, Bob. I'd like to make a request for special leave. Can I do that over the phone? Hello, Angela. You can make that request by phone, but I'll have to fill the form out. Let me get the special leave form. Okay, here it is. Hmm. Tell me your student number, please. It's H for Harry, five seven one two. H. Five seven one two. Okay. What's your address, Angela? I live at Ten Bridge Street, Tamworth. Ten Bridge Street, Tamworth. And your phone number? The telephone number is eight one zero six seven four five. Thanks. What course are you doing? I'm in the writing class. Writing. Who's your teacher this term? Mrs. Green, she spells her name like the colour. Thanks.、Mm. When does your student visa expire? Let me look. July fifteen. July fifteen. Okay. Which term do you want to take leave? Do you want dates? First, I have to write a term number. When do you want to take leave? In term one. Okay. Term one. Now, can you tell me what are the exact dates? I'd like to be away May thirty-one to June four. Okay, I've got that. You'll miss four working days between May thirty-one and June four. Is that right? Only three. I'll be away over a weekend. I'll be back at my classes on June five, so that's three days away. Look at questions nine to twelve. Now listen to more of the conversation between Angela and Bob, and answer questions nine to twelve. Why do you want to take leave, Angela? I'm going to visit my aunt May. She's my mother's sister. She and her husband are my guardians while I'm here. Where do they live? About fifty kilometers from here, near Armadale. 
Do you have to take so long if they live nearby? My mother is coming with me. She's come for a holiday, so she wants to have some time with May. And I want to spend some time with my mother too. Aren't you going home soon? I've applied to extend my time here. I expect to go home in twelve months. That is the end of section one. You now have some time to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You'll hear a coordinator for the annual ski and snowboard exhibition talking to the audience about some practical information for the whole event. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fifteen. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the annual ski and snowboard exhibition held from April the eighth to seventeenth. I am Mary Granger, coordinator of the event this year. The ten-day event features many highlights. As a snow sports lover, I know you are looking forward to a great time here. Now. I'd like to offer you some practical information about the whole event and what to expect from it. This might be the first time coming here for some of you, so for those who are still wondering about the right accommodation, I recommend Sky Hotel. It has its own health and sports clubs, just like most of the hotels here. But I love it because of its incredibly cosy beds, which guarantees good rest after an exhausting day of exploration. If you haven't brought your own equipment, like poles, boots, and skis, they are available for purchase or rent at Ski Set or Snow Rental. The exhibition this year provides a colourful look into the history of skiing and an inspiring peek into the future prospects of the sport. Apart from the fascinating photo exhibitions and the most up-to-date skiing gear, like always, this year. We have added four computers which can imitate the process of skiing, ensuring the same physical activity and sensations that appear during the skiing process on downhill slopes. But I have to warn you that it might be quite time-consuming to line up for the free trial experience. Many have posed the question as to how to enter the skiing and snowboarding competition. Well, rather than filling out the back of the entrance ticket or bombarding the committee with emails. The most effective method is by checking out the exhibition newsletter delivered every month for availability. At the most beloved local event, the exhibition has also drawn attention from the press. Last year, massive media coverage was on the worrisome amount of snowfalls. In order to avoid the same predicament, several artificial skiing slopes have been built. With more participants this year, we have lowered the entrance fee, which has been widely reported to local newspapers. A bonus for our participants is the ski program. It offers a wide variety of lessons and sessions with qualified instructors, ensuring that all ages and abilities are catered to, from the first timers to seasoned amateurs. I strongly advise you to sign up for the program, as it is offering an unprecedented thirty percent discount. That's mainly because we are cooperating with the program organizer, who promises affordable prices only for the participants of the festival this year. 
Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now, I would like to introduce you to the list of presentations during the following week so that you can better plan your schedule. The first presenter, Simon, is one of our best ski instructors. As an experienced instructor, he will inform you about the dangers that face skiers and snowboarders. Accidents happen mostly to those who are careless or ignorant. Good risk management involves considering both the probability and consequences of an accident. The next speech, titled Solution, is given by Jamie Kurt. A list of problems may occur to novice skiers and snowboarders, so he is going to offer useful information for first-timers on choosing the appropriate gears, the right dress code and ways of protecting your skin. For instance, some of you may have rented the skiing equipment, but rental footwear is notoriously uncomfortable. Then, Jamie will provide instructions to help make your footwear fit better. The third speech is about a documentary introducing skiing and snowboarding and the difference between the two sports. It also depicts a group of snow lovers exploring new slopes with breathtaking views. The director, Andy Fisher, will be there, addressing the whole shooting experience. The fourth talk is about the tricks of skiing, presented by Harry Tyson. It is most useful for those who have already tried skiing, yet still need more practice to master the sport. Harry will teach you how to turn more skillfully. A lot of people can keep their skis roughly parallel, but there's no point if you make it hard to work with and slide around out of control. Useful exercises will also be suggested to improve your parallel skiing technique so that you can tackle steeper slopes and enjoy yourself more. Jason Smith will be the last presenter, mainly addressing towards advanced skiers. He manages to apply snow climbing into skiing. Climbing in soft snow, you are floundering around. Walking becomes harder, so a good trick during climbing is to maintain a wider gait, approximately shoulder width, so that you are more stable while walking. This works for skiing as well. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a conversation between a science tutor and two first-year students who are being given some practical tips for conducting experiments. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Now, Vincent and Tessa, I've asked the two of you to come and see me because I'm a bit concerned after that incident in the science lab last week. I realise that neither of you have had much experience in a laboratory before? Well, we mostly just studied theory at high school. And we rarely got the opportunity to carry out any experiments. Fair enough. But we must all abide by certain safety procedures. The last thing we want is for one of our students to get hurt. We understand that. Our priority is to make sure that the chemistry laboratory is a safe place 
And actually, accidents can easily be prevented if you just think about what you're doing at all times. It sounds simple enough. It is if you always use good judgment, observe safety rules, and follow directions. We've read the rules on the poster inside the lab. And yet, last week you were seen working in the lab without eye protection. What do you mean? I was wearing my glasses. Prescription glasses are not safety glasses. You must always wear the goggles provided. You'll find they fit quite comfortably over your ordinary glasses. Oh, I see. Just make a habit of putting them on before you start, and keep them on until you are finished. And another thing. Never eat or drink while in the laboratory. What? Not even water? Not even water. At least not until after cleanup. Then be sure to wash your hands thoroughly with soap and hot water and dry them on a clean towel first. And Tessa, your hair should be tied back when you're in the lab. It's not that long. Still, it poses a hazard when you're working with chemicals or a naked flame. If you can't tie it back or pin it up. See if you can tuck it into a cap or something. Yes, I can do that. Thank you. Now, Vincent, last week you wore a t-shirt and trainers in the lab. The rules clearly state that long-sleeved shirts and leather shoes must be worn. Oh yes, I remember. I was late getting back from sports practice and I didn't have time to change. Well, it mustn't happen again. Okay, I'll see that it doesn't. Good. As for the rest of the safety precautions, refer to the safety poster inside the lab, and you shouldn't have any problems. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Now, before you go, a word about record keeping. Oh, good. I was going to ask you about that. What's the best way to keep track of what we're doing in the lab? Well, obviously, all your observations should be written down. I know you think you won't forget stuff and you'll be able to recall it later, but generally this turns out not to be the case. Written data, however, are a permanent record, and you must be thorough. Organize and record everything in a bound notebook. I use a spiral notebook, and I use a large notepad. That won't do. A book with binding ensures the pages are not easily removed or lost. Oh, and be sure to write your entries in complete sentences. Isn't that a waste of time? Surely notes are good enough. You might think so. But brief notes can be hard to decipher at a later date, whereas with full sentences you are less likely to misinterpret data. I make sketches, you know, simple drawings. That's a good idea, Vincent. But be sure to date them. You want us to write the date next to each drawing? Yes. Every sketch and every entry must be dated. What about headings? Use the title of the experiment as your first entry. When you have completed your observation entries, answer any questions that have been posed, and then finally write your conclusion. How do we write a conclusion? Do we need to repeat things like the questions and our findings, or the time it all took? Just write your own ideas or feelings about the experiment as the conclusion. Oh, and remember to sign it. Well, that's all I have time for today. If you have any questions, ask the lab assistant or come back to me. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Section 4. You will hear part of a lecture about time measurement. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning, everyone. Today, I'm going to talk about the research project I've been involved in on time measurement. Do you know how time is measured? Consider how we measure length and how, with time, we encounter a difficulty. Before we could grasp it, it would slip through our fingers. In fact, as we can see, we are forced to have the resource to measure something else. The movement of something in space, or a set of movements in space. All the methods that have been employed so far really measure time by a motion in space. The measurement of time is no easy matter. A scientific unit is only arrived at after much thought and reflection. As the most primitive form of measurement, the sun seems to be natural. Ever since man first noticed the regular movements of the sun and stars, we have wondered about the passage of time. Prehistoric people first recorded time according to the sun's position. To start off, let us take noon, which is when the sun is on the meridian at the highest point of its course across the heavens, and when it casts the shortest shadow. But this measurement, which was regarded as a major one in ancient times, was less important than the natural events that occurred. The earliest natural events that had been recognised were in the heavens, but during the course of the year there were many other events that indicated significant changes in the environment. Seasonal winds and rains, the flooding of rivers, the flowering of trees and plants, and the breeding cycles or migration of animals all led to natural divisions of the year, and the further observation and local customs led to the recognition of the seasons. Years later, precise measurements were invented because the passage of time was extremely important for astronomers and priests who were responsible for determining the exact hour for daily rituals and for important religious festivals. Apart from the connection with religion, accurate time measurement was also related to the government, since they divided the day or the night into different periods in order to regulate work and various events. For thousands of years, devices had been used to measure and keep track of time. The current sexagesimal system of time measurement dates back to approximately 2000 BCE from the Sumerians. It was found that the earliest ancient timekeepers were mainly invented and used in Mesopotamia, where the water clock was introduced from, as well as in North Africa, especially in the area of ancient Egypt. So, now I'd like to introduce you to some of the most well-known ancient timekeepers, as well as the disadvantages of them, for which they were replaced by various new forms of clocks that were used afterwards. A sundial is a device that tells the time of day by the apparent positioning of the sun in the sky. In the narrowest sense of the word, it consists of a flat plate and a gnomon which casts a shadow onto the dial. As the sun appears to move across the sky, the shadow aligns with different hour lines which are marked on the dial to indicate the time of day. However, it was quickly noted that the length of the day varied at different times of the year. Therefore, there could have been a difference between clock time and sundial time. In addition, the sundial was of no use at night, so a water clock was invented. The water clock or clepsydra, appeared to have been invented around 1500 BCE and was a device which relied on the steady flow of water from or into a container. Measurements could be marked on the container or on a receptacle for the water. 
It was reliable, but the water flow still depended on the variation of pressure and temperature from the top of water in the container. As the technology of glass blowing developed from some time in the 14th century, it became possible to make sand glasses. Originally, they were used as a measurement for periods of time like lamps or candles. But as clocks became more accurate, they were calibrated to measure specific periods of time. The drawback, however, as you can imagine, was the limited length of time they could measure. The last timekeeper to be introduced is the fire candle clock. Candle clocks took advantage of a simple concept, the slow and consistent nature of a burning wax candle. By utilising this process, our ancestors were able to keep steady track of the time. The clocks were created by engraving the length of the candle with evenly spaced markings. Each marking represented a single unit of time, and, as the wax burned down, each hour would disappear. However, the drafts and the variable quality of the wax mainly influenced the time of burning. Like oil lamps, candles were used to mark the passage of time from one event to another rather than tell the time of day. That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.